Good afternoon. Would you all like to stand and shake your bodies a little bit? You've been sitting for a long afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, in, in, when I was six years old, a young emigre from Europe came to my home and painted my portrait. His name was Kalman Aaron. Fifty years later, he asked me to write his story. And the result of that journey together is the book, Into the Light, The Healing Art of Common Aaron. Common is an artist, and he expresses himself with a paintbrush on canvas. I'm both a writer, a healer, and a meditation teacher, and I express myself through words. So this beautiful book, of which I'm extremely proud, and so is Common, is really two stories woven together. It's his story as he tells it, and it's his story as I understand the impact of the Holocaust on a lifetime of art, as I understand it from his, his paintings. So to me, every survivor of the Holocaust is an indomitable spirit and a master in order to have survived and then lived a life following. Common Aaron is certainly a master, a living master. And this bo book celebrates his life and his journey. He metabolized on canvas the evil he experienced during the Holocaust. He took that evil and turned it into truth and beauty over a lifetime of painting. He's been a successful painter all his life. In the process, and you will see this in, his photo, in his, the photos of his paintings, he reclaimed his own light inside. But he still didn't achieve any peace. At age 78, Kalman turned to me one day. He had just seen the pianist. He'd never wanted to talk about what ha the details of what had happened during the Holocaust. He'd seen the pianist. It gave him permission to tell his story. Many people had asked to write it. Many people had asked to film it. He lived in Hollywood. He's lived in Los Angeles all of his life since he arrived in America in 49. For some intuitive reason, he turned to me that day and said, Susan, will you write my story? The process of doing the journey with him, and, and I'll tell you more about it, he finally, when this book was published for the first time since he was a young man, he found peace. In the, in the book, there are 100 of his paintings. And you visually see the record of his own personal transformation out of the black and white world that he came, when he came to Los Angeles, when you look at his paintings, it's black and white, I'll, I'll show you this. And then over the six decades of his art, of his painting, he, you see the transformation as he leaves the darkness of the Holocaust and comes into his own light. Let me begin at the beginning of the book. This is a story of the heart and the alchemy of the soul. It is about courage, evil, survival love, loss, and hope. It is about remembering, healing, and sanctuary. Most of all, it is about choices. How does one respond to the extremes of human brutality? How does the experience of evil inform one's life, relationships, and work over a lifetime? What happens to the rage, sorrow, and despair does one ever trust again? Does one choose to remember, forgive, and heal? Oops, wait a minute here. I went too fast. My journey began 60 years ago in Los Angeles. My mother was an interior decorator. She saw this painting of a black-eyed boy in the window of a gallery where she had her own paintings and other clients' paintings framed. She, it reached into her heart because 10 years before, my parents' first child was a black-eyed baby who died at nine months. So mom asked the gallery owner who painted it. I would like to meet him. She was told he doesn't speak any English, and my mother was a powerful life force, and she said, I don't care. 
have him call me. I want him to come and paint my two living daughters. But she also wanted him to paint from a photograph of the little baby she had lost. She learned that Coleman sketched photos, did drawings. The guards would bring uh, photos of their children in the camps, and he would draw them and get an extra piece of bread. So, in 1951, he painted this drawing of my eldest sister, whom I never met. Uh, her, name, her nickname was Nani. And I have said to both my mother and Kalman, had he not painted the boy with black eyes and had my parents not had a baby with black eyes that they lost at nine months, we would have never written this story or taken this journey together. I still remember him coming into our home. He had curly blonde hair, blue eyes with a lot of sparkle, thin man. He set up his easel. He told me to sit down and be still. And then he painted my portrait. When I looked at it, I was amazed because I can't do what he does. Um, and if you, in Kalman's paintings, if you walk around the room, the eyes will follow you. It's, I don't know how he does that as well. So this is the painting he did when I was six years old. Kalman was born in Riga in 1924. He had a pencil drawing in his hand the minute he could hold a pencil. He was a child prodigy. His first gallery show in Riga was at age seven. It sold out in one day. They lived on, I call it Moscow, Moscow Street, number 40. I went there yesterday again. At age 13, President Karl Eumannus heard about this young man, invited him to the palace, and had him paint a portrait. He was so impressed, he went to his parents and said, I would like to put Kalman in the Riga Fine Arts Academy. So at age 14, Kalman entered the Riga Fine Arts Academy, and he was in heaven. His parents supported his artistic ability, even though at that time, it was not a great idea to be an artist because you would never make any money or a livelihood. At age, uh, I mean, at age 17, in July, as you know, of 1941, the Nazis came into Riga and changed his life forever. They first knocked on the door and took his father, Klein, and his uncle, David, never to be seen again. He, his mother, and his brother, who, Henik, who was five years older, were told to take their belongings and march to the ghetto. So they entered the ghetto. His mother was killed at Rumbala, along with 25,000 other Riga Jews. He remembers the day very well when he came back. He was working in a, a coat factory, preparing coats to go to German soldiers at the Luf Luftwaffe, uh, Air Force soldiers at the Russian front. Um, he and his brother survived the two and a half years in the ghetto. They were then, they then began, and well, he began to do two things in the ghetto that helped him survive. He took a chance of drawing. Um, he, in the factory, he'd get a piece of paper if he could not a pencil and do a drawing of the guard. There was a German doctor at that factory who was so impressed, he actually bought him um, a canvas, an easel, and paint, and he painted a portrait of this German, very kind German doctor. So he, he he started taking the chance of getting extra bread for him and his brother. The second thing that Kalman told me he began to do and learn how to do in the ghetto, which would help him survive, is he began to teach himself how to become invisible. He would watch, like a hawk, the guards, but somehow it's not a talent I have to be invisible. He somehow learned how to become one with, he said, one with the building. He, he stayed out of their view, and he must have been successful because he was only beaten one time during the four years. When the ghetto closed, he began a trip across Europe in seven camps, Latvia, Poland, Germany, and then the then Czechoslovakia. He was, short, he was a brief time in Kaiserwald with his brother. They were then split. He was sent to Popperballen, which was a very small camp, about 200 people. He fell in love with a young Hungarian woman at that camp, never to see her again. He then moved to Dundaga, and I, did in, I came here in 2004. 
Um, I've, I've had wonderful success. People were so helpful. I found where Kaiserwald had been. I also went to the Baltic Forest where both Popperballen and Dundago, two local people, had kept handwritten notes of the history of what they saw, and they shared that with me. He then went, was, uh, he went on the march out of Dundaga as the Russians were coming back into Latvia. He got on a ship that went down to Gdansk and from there on a barge to Stutthof. He was reunited briefly with his brother in Stutthof. He was only there a couple of weeks. He was then put on a cattle car and he ended up in Buchenwald. He was in Buchenwald in the little camp um, for a number of weeks, and then he was sent to Reemsdorf, which was a subcamp with a synthetic gasoline factory. The Allies bombed, and then he was sent on a uh, train to Trinzenstadt. The Allies bombed the train, they marched. But I want to read a couple of paragraphs of what he said about Buchenwald, right from the book. In Buchenwald, they put us in the quarantine area called the Little Camp. It was very crowded, the barracks were full. What outdoor tents they had were full of Jewish prisoners. We didn't have a place to sleep, so I slept on the ground with a rock as my pillow and stars as my canopy. My connection to life was through nature, for the Germans could not remove the stars from the sky. They could not stop the sun from rising each morning and they couldn't stop the trees from growing in the little camp. This was my connection to a world I had long since left. Every morning I awoke and saw the sun. I said to myself, victory, I have survived to live one more day. I survived by disappearing. I learned how not to be noticed by the SS and the guards while I studied the guards and the prisoners closely. I learned that the prisoners who gave up hope died, whether they were hungry or not. This camp was a place of filth, terror, darkness, inhumanity, and cruelty. It was not of this world, and it certainly was not of the world where I lived before in Riga. I had a very strong connection to the outer world and a desire to live in it once again, to be free to draw, to paint, to dream. So, he was liberated by the Russians, but not really. He and two other Latvians and three Lithuanians were put aside in a separate group in a truck. The Russians took them to the country and they stopped at a farmhouse. At that point, they took Common out to the forest, one of them with a gun. He thought he was going to be shot. The Russian soldiers stole his Red Cross package. The Russians told them, we're going to go steal some Czech horses. Wait here. We'll see you in the morning. One of the Latvian survivors was a man named Saltsy Peretsman. He and Kalman were very good friends. And together, they decided it was, they were not going to wait for the Russian soldiers to come back. And they left in the middle of the night. Now, they knew that they had to find Prague, but they didn't know where it was. They, they, so they had to hide every time. And they were in the Russian sector of Czechoslovakia, not the American sector. And they were afraid they were going to get picked up by the Russians. And then they didn't know whether they'd be sent back to Latvia or to Serbia. They had no idea. They finally decided they had to try and get some help. And there was a Russian truck coming down the road. They stopped it. And the man, the officer, the Russian officer in Yiddish said to them, I am you, you are me. He hid them in the back of the truck. He said, I cannot help you once you're in Prague. But he took them into Prague, let them out on the outskirts of Prague, and they made their way. From there, Kalman and Saltsy heard the Americans were in Pilsen, and they walked all night to get into the American zone. From there, they went to Salzburg. There was a Jewish GI, former judge from America, who took a couple of drawings that Kalman did. Because the way he and Saltsy survived, Kalman, Kalman didn't speak English then. Saltsy did. Kalman would do a drawing, Saltsy would sell it, and they'd take the money, split it, and get some food. 
So this uh, Jewish American GI took two of his drawings, unbeknownst to Kalman, and sent them to the Fine Arts Academy in v Vienna. And Kalman received a letter inviting him to do a four-year fine arts master's at one of the finest art schools in Europe. Of course, he went. The painting on the left is one of a, a Jewish survivor, a young boy that Kalman met in Vienna. The painting on the right is the woman, that, his first wife he met, Gertrude uh, Schneider. She had been 13 and her mother in Vienna put her on the Kindergarten train to England. They met, she told me we were both lost souls. She, what she admired about Kalman was his integrity. He did his education. The first, the, uh, the head of the art academy in Vienna, the first thing he told everyone who, the new students at the beginning of the year was, we had a young man come twice and apply. We didn't accept him because he didn't know how to draw. His name was Adolf Hitler. So Kalman and Trudy married, and Kalman made a decision not to go back to Latvia. And when I asked him about it, he said, they killed my parents. And so he, he still, he was frightened, frankly, when I came here in 2004 by myself to do research of his life. Um, so there's a lot of fear that he still carries in his body about the country of what happened to him. They married, they came to the United States. There was only one uh, area, I mean, the town that was open to him was Los Angeles. So. Kalman left the world, the cold of the old world. This is a painting he did in, in Sweden, outside of Uppsala, when he had a show there in the 70s. And it's the closest painting I have of what Riga might be like in the winter. And he left that cold and landed and embraced the warmth of Los Angeles and the sunshine of Los Angeles. It has been his home ever since. To this day, he, he can't get cold. He needs the sunshine because he got so cold in those four years during the Holocaust. He very quickly became a successful artist. My mother referred him to all of her clients, so he was busy painting portraits throughout the 50s. Uh, he never, she wanted to buy the Mexican boy, the painting of the Mexican boy, and, and he wouldn't do it because that was his good luck charm. It's how they met. So one year he finally gave in and said, I won't, give, I won't sell you that painting, but I'll make a copy of it, which he did and which I now have. And on the back he writes copy. He's shown in galleries and museums throughout America, in England, in Europe, and he's, his, he's collected in America, in Europe, and in Israel. Public, public figures so, soon learned about Common Era, and, and they commissioned him to do portraits. This is an oil portrait of Henry Miller, the author Henry Miller. They became good friends, and Common has many stories to share about him. He was asked in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was running for president, to do this portrait of Reagan. The only change was made by Nancy Reagan because the original uh, pastel did not have a hat on Ronald Reagan, a cowboy hat, and she insisted that that be changed and added. He would, Common tells me, had he not been an artist, he would have been a musician. He loves music. He's painted a lot of musicians. This is the composer maestro Andre Previn, who at that time was the head of the Philharmonic in Los Angeles. He's, made, he's done lots and lots of portraits of notable figures across the United States. These are just three examples. Now, Kalman developed a style that was uniquely his own. It was given the name psychological realism by the president of the university in Sweden at a show that Kalman did in the 70s. They're typically a sort of, that he catches a moment in time, and this particular one is a small one. He also does very large canvases. And in this style, he usually uses a few large bodies of color. He learned on Moscow Street how to mix color. There was a man called Oribe. He had been a professor. He had gotten a little crazy, and he used to sit on the railroad tracks on Moscow Street and paint when Kalman was a boy. He studied him. He watched him. He learned from him. 
Kalman has always painted men playing chess and checkers, often outside at the parks around his home. This is one example of two men playing checkers. This is also a large painting in the style of psychological realism. It's called The Dreamer. It's about three feet wide and four feet tall. Again, you see just two major bodies of color. And what I learned, the place that Kalman is the safest is that consciousness that he goes to when he paints. And I think he learned how to do this when he was in the camps. And then later, he paints these different uh, states of dreaming, of consciousness that he had to actually experience to save himself during the Holocaust years. Okay, I wanted to answer in this book three questions. What was the impact of the Holocaust on Kalman? How did it inform his life and his art? And most importantly, how did he respond to it over a lifetime? If I ask Kalman these questions, he says, Susan, I don't know, because he painted it it was not a cognitive process for him. So what I did is I looked at for the common themes of paintings that he has done all of his life and then tracked them from the early 50s through the 70s, 80s, and 90s to see how he, the, he painted those subjects differently, how they changed. There are four things I tracked. Children, he's always painted children. The mother and child his self-portraits, and landscapes. And this is when you begin to see this extraordinary transformation that took place in him over the years. This first painting is one my mother had, uh, which I now have in my home. Um, and this painting is called The Girl in, in Red. He's unconsciously painting what he experienced, because if you look at this child, the subject is almost the darkness, the black on the right. The child is all alone, concerned face, sitting in a void, and yet there's still the life of the red color. And I thought to myself, how many times did Common sit in this same void and wonder what kind of life he could ever have again? Now the second painting is just fabulous. This is called The Lost Children. It's, again, it's a painting my mother purchased from him in the 50s. He visited Saltsy Paritzman in New York, and Saltsy lived in Brooklyn. He, as he always did, he drew two kids, two children, walking down the street. And then when he came home, he pulled out the drawing and he painted this small painting. And if you look at this, these children look European. They're lost in a fog. And he said to me, I put the face of an old woman on the little girl, I don't know why. Well, if you had seen and lived through the Holocaust, children would become old before their time. So he, again, he's working out on canvas what he experienced watching children during the Holocaust. And now I compare details from four paintings. The first one is the girl in red. The second, the lost children. The third is this Mexican boy who, who captured Kalman's imagination. And when I look at this child, there is a, a determination to meet life on life's terms. A, a strong set of the chin, which we'll see later in a, a portrait of Kalman. So I think he connected to that childlike determination to survive, to live, that he found in this child. That's why he loved painting this child. The child on the far right is my nephew, Eric. He painted this portrait in the 1970s. And as you can see, that child is full of light. Look at the eyes. You can't paint what you do not know. So this tells me that Kalman has recaptured some of that childlike light and curiosity in his own life in order to be able to paint Eric the way he did. Now. Kalman has painted landscapes all his life. When he came to Los Angeles, the first year he had a job making maps and painting pottery. The job making maps was in downtown Los Angeles, and there's a place called Bunker Hill. It had been a very prominent place of Victorian homes in the late 1800s, 
and early 1900s. In 1950, it had become tenement buildings. It was run down. These big old homes were now broken up into apartments. What did he choose to, pay, to draw on his lunch break downtown in, in downtown LA? He walked to this neighborhood and he painted this drawing of this old rundown house. And if you look at this, there are no people, no color, no animals, no bushes, no trees. There is no life in this except this old rundown building. I believe that that is an, a mirror of his own interior landscape in 1951 when he drew this house. If you move forward 30 years, he was, do, he was commissioned by the mayor of Beverly Hills to do a series of portraits. When he was done, he asked the mayor, is it okay for myself if I paint your backyard? So he chose to do this, not to sell it, but for himself. And if you look at this landscape, you can see what change has happened in common inside. There's a lot of light dappling through the trees. There's a lot of harmony and balance and life in this painting. It is very different than that house on Bunker Hill. He painted this 30 years after he painted the Bunker Hill house. Now this is a painting he did off his balcony of downtown Los Angeles in the 1970s. I particularly like this painting because what it says to me or suggests to me is Kalman is no longer afraid of the darkness. He knows that darkness is not absolute. There is light in every dark night. And he's not afraid of the shadows. So I think this, again, intuitively ex expresses what he learned in his own journey in surviving the Holocaust and coming to America. Now, Kalman has always painted the mother and child. This first painting he worked on, it's, it's in uh, it's, uh, pastel in black and white. It is eight feet tall and three feet wide. It's a very tall painting. At the time, he, was, he did it on the back of the material where he was making maps. He took two pieces of map material, put them together, and painted this. And he worked on it night after night after night. In his own words, he said to me, I came up with the idea of getting the two faces close together to show the bond between mother and child and her anxiety, trying to run away from the ghetto or camp, glued together, she won't let go, no matter the punishment. This painting now hangs in the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust at the entrance. Its tone is the same color as the walls. It's a new, it's a new museum. It's the oldest Holocaust museum in America, but they have a new museum on Pan Pacific Park and it hangs just as you come in, and it looks as though it was painted for that place. Now, this is another painting he did, an oil painting of the mother and child. To me, it's as though these two have survived the Holocaust, but they're no longer bonded. There is no light in the mother's eyes and very little in the child's. They're stripped naked. So you can see him again express what he experienced coming through those four years uh, it, during the Holocaust. Now, his mother, he told me this, my mother believed in a world of truth and beauty and love. And then he looked at me and said, of course she was wrong, Susan. 30 years after he came to America, he painted this large oil of the mother nursing her child. When I look at this, I think Common has recaptured some of the love and intimacy that was part of his world growing up in his home with his mother. You can't paint something this tender unless you've recaptured some of that tenderness. So to me, this painting reveals his ability to reach back and capture the world in which he grew up with his mother who, thought, who believed in a world of truth and beauty and intimacy. Now. The fourth subject that I followed 
to see how it changed are his self-portraits. All artists do self-portraits. The first one is a small gouche that he painted, and he entitled it Common Marching in the Camp. He is front and center, the skeleton face with the dark eyes, the black eyes, the dark uh, line for his lips. And, and, and when I was working with this painting, at first I thought these other faces are just different faces of other prisoners, and then I realized no. They reflect different stages, psychological stages, that Kalman went through during his time in the Holocaust. There's a wise man, there's a sad man, there's a terrorized man. So to me, I think they represent all of the experience that he went through. For me, it's also a painting that's reminiscent of the medieval paintings of hell. And I see his, he, if you look at him, He's standing there with a very steely presence, standing alone, one among many. But what I hear, his thoughts, is that no one can touch me. I alone am responsible for my survival. So this small little painting that he did, for me, is an icon of what we humans do to each other when we treat each other with such brutality. In order to survive, you have to give up your light and he kept just enough breath to stay alive. And then he spent six decades reclaiming that light. Now this is a uh, drawing that Kalman did. It's very revealing to me. He, it's a uh, drawing he did at age 30 in 1954. He'd been in America for five years when he did this. And if you look closely at the painting, half of, it is in, half of his face is in the shadows, Half is in the light. Look at his eyes. They're not looking in the same direction. His right eye, the eye in the shadows, looks to me as though it's still caught back in the Holocaust. His left eye is present but wary. So what this suggests to me is at age 30, Kalman is still living in two different parallel universes that he knows exist. He's not integrated the experience of what happened to him in the Holocaust with the experience of his new life in Los Angeles. And this was done at age 30. The painting on the right is a painting he did when he was 43. It's a big oil. And as you look, you can see color coming back into his face. He has the robust markings of a man who's lived and knows much. Originally, I thought this would be the cover of the book. But when I sat with this painting, the, the eyes carry so much sorrow, I couldn't put it on the cover of his book. There's a certain watchfulness. There's a profound sadness. Now, there's another thing that fascinates me about Kalman, and, and it shows up in this painting. There's no hatred in Kalman's eyes. After all he experienced, he's not a bitter man, and he doesn't carry hatred. He doesn't carry trust of everyone either. <laughs> all right. So, and you see far more of these paintings in the book. You can see that he has clearly reclaimed part of his light and his life over the years of painting. But there were limits. He was married unsuccessfully three times. He has one son who's about 40 years old. All of his, he has succeeded as an artist all of his life. He never had an agent. Everyone always told him to have an agent. He turned down some big shows in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Florida, even though he lived as an artist all his life, earned the money from selling his paintings. When he was in the camps, as I said before, one of the things he taught himself to do was become invisible. And in his mind, invisibility equated with life and being seen equated with death. That belief carried through all of his life and it kept a veil on his art. He could be far more famous than he is. He was never interested in money. He was not interested in fame. He was only interested in his art. And finally, 
Kalman made a decision, he and Trudy, when they came to this country, when he was with survivors that he knew or were just acquaintances, and they'd talk for hours about what happened. The next day, he couldn't function. He couldn't get up and function. So he and Trudy made a decision when they came to America to put that behind them, to seek new friends who didn't have any history with the Holocaust in order to function. So basically, Kalman repressed those memories for decades. And I believe that his decision, when he asked me at 78 to tell his story, that the pain of remembering, the pain of not remembering, finally became greater than the pain of remembering. Now, he was 78 years old in 2003 when that, on that sunny day in California, he turned to me and said, will you write my story? We spent, I spent hours with him interviewing him. I came to this country to find evidence of his life. I went to all of the camps, all seven of them across Europe, to find evidence of his life. I took that back. I read every, uh, I read Dr. Ezra Gilles' book. I read survivors' books that I found, Latvian survivors that I found that were in English. Um, I met with three survivors here, Margaret Vestermanis, Max Kitt, and Alexander Bergmanis. I also met Jack Ratz and Jakob Bosner in America, so I, there were six survivors that I had interviewed specifically. Um, and when I met with Coleman, I continued to stir the pot. I asked him, do you remember Jack Ratz? He used to be in your home. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Do you remember the, the Coral Synagogue on fire and what happened there? Um, so I was constantly stir, stirring the pot. In reaction to remembering and my stirring the pot, the nightmares came back when he was in his 78, you know, when he was 78, over the years that we were doing it. He'd, get a, he'd wake up with a, a fast heartbeat, and there were many, many trips to the hospital. So I believe that, that what happened to him and the other survivors is in the cells and marrow of a person's bone. And it was a physical purging that he went through in telling me these stories. There were days he couldn't go on. He just simply couldn't go on. And then I'd come back the next day, and we'd proceed. So there were costs, but there were tremendous benefits, and that's what I want to emphasize. He had the, the uh, freedom to be in shoes differently. And let me give you a couple examples. Kalman found a new ease in him, his own life and it, in his own body, and it shows up as always in his paintings. The painting on the left is one that he did of men playing chess in a Santa Monica Park in California, and he did it in the 1960s. If you look at the colors, the colors are pretty dark. There's one man with his, his hand on his forehead. After he spent hours with me telling me his story, he painted the men playing cards in Roxbury Park. It is another park near where he lives. And if you look at the, this painting, it's in pastels, not oils. The colors are lighter. The men are completely at ease. They're not pondering the meaning of life. They're simply living it. I think that's a reflection of the new ease that Kalman gained in his own life after telling his story. The second new freedom he had was to take a chance and marry for a fourth time. He met a woman named Miriam Sanderval. They fell in love. After his own son was married, he married Miriam. It has not been an easy marriage by any means, which they will both say, <laughs> but they are still married. And you can see on, this is a picture of them on his wedding day, and if you look in his eyes, there is a hope for a happy relationship and a happy marriage. Now, this is in the museum. Kalman has been asked for decades to show what I call his paintings that are echoes of the Holocaust. He said no every single time. After he had told me the story, and after I'd done the first draft of this book, which he read from cover to cover, he was asked to show some of his regular paintings along with the Holocaust paintings 
at a uh, tolerance education center in Rancho Mirage in California. He said yes. This eight by three foot painting for the first time in 60 years left his studio basement and it was shown there. After this show, I arranged to have it given to this new LA, the new building for the LA Museum of the Holocaust and it hangs there perfectly. And Kalman used to say to me before he was willing to give it up, he would say, I don't know if I'll ever give it up, but if I do, it has to be in the right home. This museum is blocks away from his apartment. He is very pleased to have that painting hanging in the museum. So what this tells me is that when we remember, when we have the courage to remember trauma and brutality, we have the ability to heal, and that lets us let go of things that represent the past. This was huge for Kalman to be able to let go of this painting and let it go into the museum. The fourth big, big change for Kalman is the willingness to be seen. I wasn't even sure whether he would stay alive to see the book published. He was alive. We, it was published in 2012. We had a huge um, presentation in Los Angeles at the Museum of Tolerance, which is part of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in LA. Two governors of the state of California were on the stage applauding Kalman. Rabbi Marvin Heyer did a beautiful presentation about the meaning of Kalman's life and survival. I presented a lengthier presentation of his art, his painting, and his transformation. And the whole time, I watched him in the audience, and he was beaming. And at the end of the presentations of his being honored, he came up on stage to answer some questions. And I thought, OK, he can now be seen for the first time in his entire life since he was 17 years old. That was a result of his having the courage to tell his story. The final gift of this book is that Commons found peace. He has always been an upbeat man. He's always been a charming man. He's self-educated. He's intelligent. He can discuss politics around the world. He's a, a brilliant artist. But he never found the peace until this book was published. And this is his legacy. And this is what he cares about. He cares about his art. So to me, he's a master. He's achieved some mastery over his experience and his emotions. Has it, the history of the Holocaust been erased? Of course not. It couldn't be. So I ask, what is this man's legacy? And there are three important things to me. The first is his example. When I have a challenge, I think about what he went through. I can handle this. When I talk to young children in schools about his life, I say to them, if he can handle this, what he handled, what are the traumas, what are the challenges you have, you can certainly handle the ones you have. So he's an example of someone who maintained his integrity, he stayed committed to his muse, which was making art, he never cared about, cared about money or fame, he wrestled on paper and on canvas with the evil that he experienced. There were no shortcuts to get to the light that he recaptured at the end of his life. And he turned all of that experience quite literally into truth and beauty. If you look at Kalman's paintings, there's something multidimensional about them. I have lived with them all my life. I never tire of them. I tire of other painters, but not of Kalman. The second legacy to me is, is held in this book. It's in his art. For me, it's a sacred vessel of transformation and personal alchemy. Anyone who touches this book will also be healed consciously or unconsciously. As I said, there were no shortcuts for Kalman to become who he is today. He had to do the hard work, and he did it all on canvas. So people around the world who've witnessed genocide, violence, killing, or even abuse in their private home will be healed and helped by the, the art itself, the resonance of, resonance of this art. So that is a great legacy. Now, for me, the most important part, of course, is what do we learn from this? 
What is the meaning of all those who gave their lives or survived the, the Holocaust? And for me, it is the invitation to remember we are all human. What we do to one of us, we do to ourselves. And it's in his whole message of his life to me is to peacefully resolve conflict without restoring to violence and killing ever again. So let me complete let me com 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 conclude by reading the last paragraph in the book. And the title of it is Living Alchemy, A Touch of Grace. Grace may be a strange word to use in referring to this man. I have never discussed it with him, but I see it throughout his life. One does not have to be religious to experience grace, and common is not after what he went through. It comes in moments of magic to help us manifest our desires and dreams. It is a state of being. Grace was present in his boyhood home. He found it in the camps when he got quiet so no one would see him. It was present as he chose art school in Vienna, a new life in Los Angeles. It is present in the humility he learned in the camps, and it is a state that he occupies when he paints. So in a mysterious way, grace has touched his life and helped him walk with courage and freedom upon this earth in the light of the sun. What a gift his life, what a revelation of truth and beauty, his art. Thank you. Let me also say that I brought his beautiful book, which I'm going to sell for 15 euros. I do not want to go back to America with any of them. They're too heavy. <laughs> so I'm going to be outside and happily talk with you and sign books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.